Hey, um, hi everyone. Welcome to the third uh, PSA webinar series. Uh, my name is Donna Smith from the Open University and I'm co-chair of the P uh, PSA Teaching and Learning Network. Um, this webinar series focuses on a kind of general teaching and learning alongside um, uh, online learning. So you'll see a kind of a mix of sessions over the next um, uh, few months, focusing on kind of general stuff and online stuff. And this, these sessions follow on from the, the spring and summer series we held, which focused exclusively on, on online learning. So today's session is called Teaching and Learning the Student Perspective, uh, led by Maxine David, uh, as well as some of her MA students who we'll introduce um, in a moment, but we have Jana, Kevin, Lucas and Sara. Uh, this session will cover what we can learn from students being taught uh, totally or mostly online, as well as uh, what we as academics are doing well and perhaps less well. And it's actually you know, a great opportunity to hear from students themselves for the first time, I think, in our, in our webinar series. So we're due to finish in about an hour's time and there will be time for questions. Um, we'll moderate the chat, so do post your questions there. And also please note the session is recorded and make sure you're muted. Um, you might want to put your view on gallery. You can do that by, uh, I think it's on the kind of the top right of my screen. You just click the gallery view. That way you'll get all of the speakers um, rather than just um, the person speaking at that particular moment. Um, so that's our advice, but it's up to you. Um, and without further ado, please welcome Maxine. Thank you very much, Donna, um, and uh, thank you again to the organisers for this uh, much needed series. It's actually saved my life quite a lot this semester and I've been enacting some of the advice that I was listening to over the summer in previous webinars. Um, I, I, when I gave the, uh, my, I, so I gave a webinar in August as well, and as I say, I've watched some of um, the, the others, and I've, I've certainly tried to mitigate um, some of the worst effects of online teaching as a result of those um, webinars. Um, but I, I did always have the uneasy feeling that we were missing something in terms of understanding our student perspective at a time when we were actually quite ill prepared um, for this, right? So I certainly never chose to do online um, teaching, nothing against online teaching. It's just not the way that I, I decided my career would go. Um, and so I, I really did want to us to hear the student uh, perspective. Now I've always thought it important to hear the student voice when we're reflecting on the design of our courses, but I've never thought it as important as I do now when I'm receiving emails from students at quite different ends of the spectrum in terms of their ideas about how they can learn best and how we can teach best in an online environment. Um, and the reason that I think that it is so much more important now that we hear from students is that I can see that even excellent and perhaps especially excellent students are struggling with the online environment. So as a result, I've assembled um, for today a small group of students who I think occupy sensible, thoughtful positions that reflect the range of opinion that I've heard, but in a non-polemical way. Um, before I ask them to um, introduce themselves to you, I'd like to express my thanks to them for giving up their time to talk to us all today, because I also know how much pressure they are under. Um, Otherwise, um, once they've introduced themselves, I'm going to put my, um, some questions to them for about 25 minutes now, um, and then we'll open up the remaining half hour to all of you. But could I again just kind of encourage you to put questions into um, the chat? So I think it would be quite good um, for, for you without any kind of skin in the game in terms of student evaluations or national student survey worries for those of you who, for whom this is a worry. Um, to be able to just talk to students um, in, in a very kind of open way. And I think it would be good for them as well to also hear a little bit more about the constraints under which we feel that we're working and, um, and, to, and for us to be able to understand how we might do a little bit better than we've been doing. Um, so I'm going to go across the top. So I've got Lucas, Jana, Kevin and Sarah. So I'll go in that order. And then if you could just give um, your name, your degree program, tell us whether you're February or September intake um, so the audience know um, how new you are to LIDA, um, perhaps your previous study um, and where you studied as well. So Lucas. 
Thank you. So uh, my name is Lukas. I'm from Germany, um, student of European Union studies at Leiden University since September this year. Um, my previous studies were German-French studies um, that I studied in Regensburg in Germany and Nice in France. Thank you. Thank you. And Jana? Yeah, um, thank you. I, my name is Jana Iken. Um, I also do the International Relations European Udis, Union Studies program. I'm also uh, September 2020 intake and I previous, previously studied political science and sociology in Göttingen for my bachelor's degree, Germany. Thank you. And Jana, you're studying remotely, aren't you? You're not actually in Leida. Yeah, I'm still in Germany. That's right. Kevin? Hi, uh, I'm Kevin Kaiser. I'm part of the, as well, um, the U European Union Studies in September 2020. Um, and, but I did do the one year long pre master before here in Leiden. Um, in my undergrad, I did a corporate degree, meaning that I worked for a software company and they sent you off to go studying. I studied information systems uh, at the Friedrich Alexander University in Nuremberg. Thank you. Um, and just to say as well that Kevin had experience at Leiden of both uh, offline um, teach, so in-person teaching for most of his pre-masters, and then the last couple of months uh, he was, like the rest of us, thrown into the online only world. Um, and then Sarah, please. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Marinijet. I'm doing the International Relations Global Conflict in the Modern Era. Um, Previously, I did uh, international studies at Leiden as well, and I focused on the Middle East, and I started in February with my master's. Um, thank you very much. And I just do want to say, because it matters, I think, for some of the conversation, um, that three of the students are, well, none of them is working in their first language, although Sarah studied in Canada, and her bachelor's was also taught in English as well. Um, but actually, I do think that language has been one of those things that we haven't necessarily thought about enough in um, the online world. Um, so um, I, I'd like to go to, uh, to all of you first, um, really to think about um, the more kinds of inclusive aspects. Um, uh, so diversity issues, inclusivity issues. So Kevin, I know that um, you have experienced um, quite a lot of problems with tech, which has impacted negatively on your ability to participate. So I'll come to you um, for that first. Um, but maybe we can also go on to um, just talking about some of the impact of online teaching only on your, um, your sense of well-being, your mental health as well all right so if we can if we can take this very kind of um problematic issue i think first of all and if i begin with you kevin but i, I will come to each of you on this yeah um i mean it is kind of ironic having so many tech issues with like a tech background um <laughs> but um yeah what i i don't know if you you know but in at Leiden university participation is graded so for us to participate online is a prerequisite and um, you want to do that well. And often I find myself struggling because I'm often disconnected while I try to raise a point. Then like once I reconnected, the conversation has passed and like my momentum kind of to, to um, contribute has passed really. Um, and that does give me some sort of you know, anxiety. And I think this is a problem in student housing in general that like bandwidth here is a problem and that can negatively impact your experience about your studies. Um, do you want me to also raise the point of emotional well-being right now or yeah so i think <laughs> one of the things with that comes with the fully online learning is you kind of you know feel constrained to your own apartment which in student housing isn't really um too spacious and um i just had this kind of conversation yesterday because i went out with a with a friend of mine just uh, after a presentation we had and you know he was just kind of tapping my shoulder and i was like well this is actually the first time we had like some sort of physical contact in the last two weeks so i think it really does kind of change your like your sociabilities in a way thank you and and lucas i know that you've got um some concerns here and i think it would be really good if we could understand a little bit more about how this has impacted on you 
Yeah, thank you. So um, obviously there is, and we all experience this, a lack of social interaction, but I think it's especially for those international students who came to Leiden in September, having had no single physical class since then. So that makes it really hard to have this um, daily social interaction that we have automatically when we go in the, even when we have a lecture where we don't interact, but we're with people around us with my fellow students. So now I do it here uh, in my uh, student apartment and um, yeah, I, I tend to feel quite isolated uh, and lonely uh, doing this. And I have the feeling that I have, um, I, I have the opportunity to live here in Leiden, but it's a little bit stressful because sometimes I have to force myself to, to put social interaction in my time schedule per day as possible as it could be, because I don't have it during university. University for me is now me working alone by myself. Um, and another thing that um, I realized since I started this um, master now um, in an online environment is that, that I lost kind of the connection to what am I doing. And this might may sound a little bit abstract, um, but having not been in the university, not having really seen my fellow students or professors, um, sometimes as a student, you tend to uh, lose the sense. Why am I doing this? Uh, for what? Um, I'm all by myself um, and not in my environment where I should be. So um, having stressful um, anxiety because of social uh, interaction lack and this loss of connection um, is kind of a double burden, I would say, for me. Yeah, and I think, you know, I mean, I, I was saying to you, so, you know, when we were talking about this and, and, and you were talking about it as if, um, as if actual buildings were important to you as well, that, you know, just actually physically not seeing um, a building. And I was telling you a story about a student last semester who cycled from The Hague to Leida um, about four weeks into lockdown because he, he, he just wanted to reconnect with the buildings. He knew nobody was there, but he just actually really had to be there. Um, and I and I think certainly for for me and maybe maybe others have done this much better, but this is not something that I've thought about um, sufficiently. Really, I'm not sure that I can do anything about it, but um, but I think it's really good to um, raise awareness of it. Um, and I know Jana as well that um, you, you know you you're kind of thinking about your future career and your masters was very much a part of that. So maybe you could just um, say a little bit about that. Yes, um, I would agree with what um, Lucas said. Um, and for me personally, also, I want to start with my professional career after my master's and I aim to pursue an international career. And um, with everything that's been going on, um, that that's it's just insecure if that's going to be a possibility at all. And that's what I've been working towards for so long and also work for in this master. And I think for students who want to kick off their professional career soon, um, this just untaps this anxiety even more and makes it even more difficult um, to see the sense in what we're doing right now if the goal we want to reach is, um, yeah, is so ambiguous and we don't even know if um, it's going to be a possibility once we're there. And uh, I think this adds to this disconnect that Lucas described and to the insecurity and anxiety some students feel. Thank you. And, um, you know, Sara, so, you know, you were, you were talking, we'll, we'll come on to um, kind of assessment and participation and everything, but you were talking um, a bit about how you, you interact less now online in classes than you used to. Uh, when you were together and uh, and actually I've heard from a lot of students who say that they interact more online than they did in person that they feel kind of safer online but I think that there is this that there is this interesting dynamic that I don't quite understand about how some of us um, you know are, are just different I feel like I'm the same I talk as much online as I do offline um, but but for you I think it has been the opposite and then the other thing that you were talking about is um, just this lack of connection um, to well, people like me, essentially. So maybe you could just talk us through a little bit of that. Yes, so um, I felt like uh, when we were attending classes in person, uh, we could um, have a deeper connection with lecturers, but also with students. Uh, and for me, uh, this resulted in uh, a more active uh, uh, participation during class. So uh, I felt uh, more 
open or connected to lectures and students to be able to um, give my opinion about topics uh, and discuss more. Whereas in an online platform, I feel like um, it withholds me from uh, participating in a uh, on a deeper level, um, and this also results in the fact that. Um, if uh, eventually you uh, might need a, a kind of a letter uh, from a teacher or whoever, uh, I don't know who to turn to because I don't know uh, which teacher knows me well enough um, to write me, for example, um, a letter of, uh, for a future work uh, because I've never met the teacher. So it's, it makes it more difficult um, to create that connectedness and uh, the participation in an online platform. Yeah, and uh, I, I've told you um, you can come to me, but I but but I completely appreciate that. Yes, you know this is a this is a concern. It is a natural thing. I mean, very, most often I'm asked for letters of reference after a good class or something. You know, a student feels like okay, I really connected with her. I know that I'm going to be applying, so I'll, I'll I'll seize this opportunity. And yeah, I recognise that that then becomes more difficult um, in in this. And again, you know that that's not something that I had really thought about very much in terms of references yes the lack of connection to students but not what it might actually mean for them in more kinds of um, practical terms so i think that that's a really important um point um you know I, we obviously have got a lot of questions for you about the challenges that are presented by having um to deliver um all your assessments um online um i can tell you that um uh you know we have as a program talked a lot about what some of these so once we knew that we would be online having conversations about what the consequences of that would be for students what the impact would be on their learning one of the things that we were very heavy on was were the social aspects we understood that this was going to be the biggest thing um, you know the most immediate and perhaps the most important loss um, so as a result, we did think about our assessments and we thought very hard about kind of designing them in such a way as to ensure that you had to, you had to work with each other, that there was a lot of teamwork. Um, for at least one of my classes, I make you switch teams. So when we're doing the role plays for regionalism, right, uh, three of you are in that class. Um, but just for the others, I make them switch groups each week because I knew that they didn't get the opportunity to meet people otherwise. And I thought that this is quite a good way of making sure that they're meeting a wide range of students, but also making sure that they didn't get caught in a very kind of toxic group as well, because, you know, group dynamics don't always turn out very positively. So I didn't want to cement them into the same group for um, 12 weeks. Um, but I, you know, so I, I, I was thinking very hard. The rest of us were thinking very hard um, about this, but maybe we can just talk a little bit about um, the perspective from the student point of view. And um, maybe uh, if we can go in reverse order this time. So Sarah, maybe just talking a little bit about the, um, the types of things that you have to do in assessment terms um, and what impact this has had on you. Um, yes, so uh, one of the things I really struggled with uh, are the online assessments and also group work because I find it very difficult to connect with students like um, from uh, online. So you have to create multiple group chats, you have to be constantly um, conducting video calls, uh, which is uh, very time consuming, but also difficult uh, because it doesn't create a uh, connection that you could have in person. Um, and besides all the work that you do, you usually have to be able to um, show that you're participating enough. So you have to um, put a lot of effort in showing that um, that your participation is as high as it would be otherwise. <clears throat> Jana? Yeah, so um, I think there, there are really uh, different aspects of this to you so um first of all the assignments were really spread out so um different teachers use different ways of um uh so yana we've lost you for now so i'm going to go to if i go to kevin and hopefully yana can uh fix this so kevin 
Yeah, I, I think, I suppose there is some like ambivalence. Like on the one hand, I think it is really important to have this group work to kind of connect to others, you know, because we have this lack of social interaction. I think it's really important. On the other hand, I think there is an extent, like to an extent it's a little bit of an overcompensation. So we have like so much group work in so many different classes and you always have to like set up like your WhatsApp groups, you have to set up like your, your document man management system. And just from my like, like practical experience from like the software company work. Um, usually if, if you like set up a virtual team, you would start off with like a physical project kickoff to like kind of like get to know each other and to build trust. And I think that is something that we like currently lack. And I think that really um, elevates some of the, some of the problems you would usually have during group work. Oh, Maxine, we can't hear you. I got so excited. Um, so I just saw um, a question um, pop up, Kevin, um, about uh, the tools that you use. Um, so, you know, are you using whiteboards? Um, all right, so so what, what are you using? So Sarah talked a little bit about WhatsApp, but what other tools are you using to manage some of this? Yeah. So I'm a huge fan of um, Microsoft Teams because it has a great um, API to SharePoint, which allows you to really like store your uh, different files. And it really allows you also to like organize in different categories. I think way better than, than Dropbox does because it also allows you to, to video chat in there. So my to go tool is uh, Microsoft Teams to do that. And Lucas, if you could just talk a little bit about your experiences. Yeah, so I would um, connect the group work to the social interaction part um, because it's helping me. What happens um, now is that when we have a, a group work and we have in every subject actually one, at least one to do, is that um, we get the, the contact uh, email or um, numbers from the other students. Uh, so this is a reason for me to connect, uh, let's say we have a group presentation of four people to at least three people from 60, 70 in my study program. Um, and this gives me the opportunity to work on a project, obviously, together. But also what happens is that some kind of WhatsApp groups um, that we create for this reason, which is the usual tool that we use to communicate, um, they uh, sustain. And even after the group project, we would um, have like kind of um, um, like we exchange in this uh, group and I know that these three people that I got to know and got to know a little bit better now I can ask them questions about my study program we can talk about deadlines and eventually when these people are in line we could also meet so um, this is very helpful for me I'm grateful for the group works right now thank you and I see Jana you're back but are you frozen And uh, well, I think we're, for those of you who are teaching online, this is uh, very familiar um, and unfortunate. Um, the, I'm, I'm seeing a, a, quite a lot of questions um, or comments pop up about different tools that you're using. Um, and, I, and, and I just want to maybe kind of get to, um, to press you a little bit more um, in terms of your workload and the type of training that uh, might be available to you um, but, and might be accessible to you, but do you have time for it? Because yes, there are lots of tools. And I think though that we have um, this assumption that actually students pick up on different uses of tech very, very quickly. That, that personally is not my experience. Some do and some, and some don't. So that, that's the same as with uh, um, people my age, all right? Um, but maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, whether you think that there are other tools out there, but whether or not you have time to get used to using them. And maybe begin with you, Kevin. So, you know, you are tech handy. So. Um, I think, I mean, I've heard about Padlet before. I think that was one of the comments down there. And I think like the University of Regensburg, for example, now kind of like moves on to moving that. I've never actually worked with that. Um, I heard it somewhat similar to Slack, um, but 
I think it's always kind of like a licensing problem, like what licenses do the university provide for which programs um, if you know some of them aren't free. And um, I find Teams just really kind of all encompassing and it really helps me to like structure work in groups. And I mean, WhatsApp obviously is, is really important, I think, to just like connect to your group and having video calls, you know. But Kevin, how are you experiencing um, the you know the the tech aspects uh, with people, All right? And you know, and I'll, I'll bring Sarah in here in a minute because I know that for the actually for their flipped classroom they ran yesterday, she ran all uh, of the tech for that. But I wonder if everybody is comfortable with all of this, or do you kind of do you hit a barrier with some of the students that you're working with? I think I think every tool like there has to be kind of like this. Um, step where you can like overcome like the first insecurity like about using it and um i think if you have one person in the group that is like like well versed in using a tool they can like really get the other people on board but i, I, I believe that everybody's kind of lacking that knowledge or their experience that, that would make it really hard let me grab yana while she's moving um can you hear me yana okay can you talk yeah okay all right so we were we were still just talking about um some of the challenges of um group work but we're really talking about tech really um so kevin was saying that you know he likes to organize everything in ms teams um and because there are questions in the chat about using things like padlets etc and we've got like you know we have licensing um problems but i really just wanted to um hear a little bit about what it is like for the students in terms of are there assumptions made about your ability to kind of learn uh, new way, you know, learn how to use new technology very, very quickly. Is this time consuming? So kind of what's, what's the impact on you? Um, yeah, so I think um, these assumptions are made. I think sometimes there are um, difficulties. Um, I think especially most of us experienced that with MS Teams in the beginning. Um, however, now it became uh, the tool mostly used for um, small group meetings. Um, but yeah, I think especially as so much happens online, um, many there's like kind of a battle maybe also going on between um, students. Just as it got interesting, uh, student to student battles. <laughs> um, but Sarah, maybe I can um, maybe I can come to you now. Yeah, maybe I can uh, fill in Jana because um, we also have had discussions uh, about on which platform to communicate. Um, so at first we used to have for uh, one project uh, WhatsApp video calls, but then we noticed that that wouldn't work for everyone. So then we switched to MS Teams, whereas we used to um, do our documents uh, through Google Drive so everyone could see and uh, read what we are making and writing and when it came to the presentation with a PowerPoint uh, it became more difficult because you had to do word, uh, a voiceover so uh, that could not be done online so you had to download the PowerPoint and then send it to the other person so then you really realize that you're trapped in this uh, process where everyone wants to do their best but at the same time technology does not allow you to um, to access uh, all the tools that are uh, that are expected from you. So we had to send the document all the time <laughs> back and forth so we could all see it. Um, and for in the presentation, um, some of the group mates, they were like, okay, please you do it because I don't know how to go there. And you, you feel the anxiety before presentation because a lot of students uh, have the feeling that during presentation, the, something might go wrong um especially with like when we had breakout rooms so uh, how are you gonna divide it is it gonna go on time um so these are all things and factors that play an important role and i think uh, they're very time consuming when it comes uh to creating a group project uh which should be taken in consideration yeah um and you know in in breakout rooms uh it's a shame we've lost yana because uh, she was a she was a very strong voice actually for breakout rooms here um but um just just to kind of finish on the tech unless um, unless you had something you wanted to add here lucas 
I think maybe to the workload um, when it comes to um, like technical issues and what also new new methods maybe that um, some professors might take is um, I see that a lot of professors they really um, want to give us the best study ex learning experience we could get out of the current situation um, or, and are using tools such as um, they might give us pre-recorded um, little like knowledge videos, um, pre-recorded uh, lectures then they would um, still do live lectures so that we can engage with each other um, and add to this maybe group presentations so that we can even engage more. Um, but uh, what may happen sometimes with this is that the actual workload for a particular subject could get bigger um, than it would be in a, when we would have physical classes. Um, so I think there is like, the good student experience we want to achieve uh, with a lot of interaction and um, more knowledge that we can get out of it and the workload aspect with te te technical uh, aspects. Thank you. Um, all right, so I, I do want to go to the questions, but just quickly because uh, Jana's back and Jana, I want to, you know, you, you were telling us positive stories about breakout rooms really, um, particularly it turns out when the lecturer is not in the room. Yeah, so the way I experienced it, um, the breakout rooms are always really productive. So, cause these are more or less the only spaces we have to really exchange our ideas and our thoughts. Um, I think every student really tries to use this time we have there um, intensely and we're really debating and I've never uh, I've never been in a breakout room that wasn't super productive. So um, I think breakout rooms are really a positive thing um, because it's so much easier for students also to talk in groups of five people than in groups of 40 in an online environment. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, we've talked a little bit among ourselves about um, how the size of the class really, really matters. Um, and I know that for some of the bigger classes, um, lectures were just delivered, um, you didn't get interaction, that that was not well received, um, understandably. Um, you know, but it, it, it's interesting for me to hear it, so I'm, I'm not so happy with breakout rooms because I can't be there. Um, and I feel like, you know, if I've, got, if I've got the two hour time that students want me to be there, but actually, I think, uh, Kevin, you were, you were commenting that, uh, the things turn, turn quite negative as soon as somebody like me comes into a breakout room. Yeah, I mean, that is kind of the thing with like graded participation because we, you, I mean, I can just repeat what Jana said, like the breakout rooms are usually really productive and constructive, but as soon as like the, the lecturer comes in because everybody is so concerned about their participation rate, um, everybody is so keen to get their, their voice heard and then that kind of completely derails the conversation unintended consequences. What I am hearing from you in terms of tech though is that actually this is somewhere um, where we don't do well in terms of um, understanding the impact on you, um, understanding the difference in your skills and then perhaps the weight that that puts on one or two students in a group versus um, the others. The extra anxiety as you've got um, as a result because the tech is an integral part of, of you being able to deliver what you want to deliver um, well, and we haven't trained you on it. And I also think that probably some of us are very bad um, at this aspect as well. Um, so um, certainly that's something that we need to uh, think about a little bit more, but maybe if we can go to um, the chat, Donna, and pick up on some um, other issues. Sure, thank you Maxine and everyone else as well. It's been really interesting, I think for the first time hearing um, the student perspective and you know, there's been certain issues which have never really occurred to me before, um, you know, kind of how having the tutor present can have such an impact um, in the breakout room um, in that way. It's really interesting to kind of um, to hear about that. So um, there's been some questions in the chat box and also I think kind of collating stuff kind of online as well as, as, we, as we go along. Um, so I'll just kind of pose them to you Maxine, perhaps you can then kind of, um, you know, uh, answer them, them yourselves and also kind of speak to the students as well and kind of uh, get some feedback there and who the best person is to answer um, each question. Um, 
I was interested at the very beginning about the uh, issue of language um, which came up. Um, obviously that's possibly more of an issue in, in your university than in some other universities etc. Um, but I just wondered if, if you had any, any, any more general, general kind of comments on that and, and, and the impact um, you know it's had on you know students perhaps um, you know at your university kind of working online. So it's definitely something that I thought about because um, our program is, so we're, we're a Dutch university, obviously, but it's an international um, relations program. So we're therefore allowed to teach it in English um, and students are only admitted to the program if they have got a certain standard of English. Um, but two things that I was thinking about in advance was that if we were online, not all students would be in LIDA. Um, and, uh, and, and therefore they might not be surrounded by other people speaking English. Um, but I'm going to bring Lucas in, in, in a little while, who is in LIDA, but, but still kind of um, experiences uh, this problem. But the other thing is that what I know generally about students who are not working in their first language is sometimes there's a little bit of a time lag in the conversation. It just takes them that, um, that little bit longer to get their, you know, to process the question, to get their thoughts in order and then they can feel in an online, in an offline, in an in-person environment that the conversation moves along very um, quickly. So I, I've experienced this throughout my career. Um, but I think actually it's, it's kind of worse in an online environment because concentration levels are, um, are impacted so much more. Um, so I certainly, I've attended a lot of webinars, but I have sometimes, um, and I'm working in my first language, I'm sometimes forcing myself to kind of reconnect to the screen and everything else. And then I think for those who are not working in their, in their first language, that, that just must be, um, be doubled, really. Which is why I encourage students to use the chat um, when we're in the live room. I also encourage them to um, post things on, so we're using Brightspace as our BLE, so I create discussion um, posts for them so that they can do that. And I, and I look at the entirety of that when deciding on their mark for active participation. Um, but, but this brings it, its own problems as well because they, they then feel pressure to, to kind of interact in all of those environments, which, which is not my intention, but I can see how they would do that. But to go to the um, language thing, um, Lucas, this is something that you've talked about quite a bit. Yes, so um, my mother tongue is uh, German. Uh, I have studied and doing my bachelor's in German and French, never in English. Uh, so English is a language that surrounded me during my education, but um, never in a daily life and never in a ac real academic field like the university. So um, what happened now here is I come uh, in September uh, to, to Leiden um, and I, I felt this lack of using English, first of all, in a, in a daily basis because there is a restriction on uh, social interaction. Um, so um, I don't really use the language on a, daily, uh, on a daily basis, especially not in the beginning. And then having to sit down um, after like two weeks to work, uh, for instance, on my literature review in English, which would be my first academic piece uh, of paper to write. Um, and not having this connection to the language at all, uh, which seems a little bit abstract, but it was just so far away from me. And then sitting also by your own, by yourself there was a huge challenge. And I feel a little bit more comfortable now, two and a half months in. Um, but I think that has to be taken into consideration um, for those uh, who come from, whose mother tongue is not English. Thank you. Um, a question, Maxine, kind of linked to that um, uh, from William is about kind of making sure no one is left behind. Um, that was specifically a question about um, kind of checkpointing. So, for instance, if you're in a in a tutorial or an online tutorial or a session making sure that everyone kind of um, you know has reached a particular point and you can all kind of move on together etc but I think it's actually a, a more general issue as well about making sure that people aren't left behind um, uh, in online learning um, perhaps it's it, perhaps it's easier to kind of you know to, to kind of tell in in-person in teaching you can have those kind of you know conversations at the end of the, of the session of a student or a student can come up to you and kind of 
you know, say, can you just explain this a little bit in a bit more detail for me, etc. But um, how do we how do we ensure that, that students are, uh, you know, are all are all up to date and all at the same stage as much as possible? Any kind of solutions that you've found, Maxie, you know, anything that students have found useful? Uh, I would say that this is something we're bad at, at Lida. Um, and I, it's something that I notice uh, even in usual times. The difference between teaching in the UK and teaching in the Netherlands for me has been enormous. Um, we very much work on the basis that um, these are adults, um, they're master's students, so we're teaching a master's program, you know, not bachelor's. Um, and uh, if they need help, they'll, they'll ask for it. Um, now, I, I know that that is misguided. Um, and I suppose the, the, best, the closest I get to any checkpointing is, um, so cert certainly this, this year, is contacting students who I think are struggling. So here the active participation really does help. Um, because if I see that some students are not participating at all, I've emailed them and asked um, and, um, at, at, and also because we are doing so much um, group work and uh, they get teamwork um, grades, um, actually for the most part this does mean that everybody in the team contributes something so you feel that there is um, some, some learning but we have um, we, we have no pressure, no encouragement um, to do this kind of thing. And I think it is very, very much on a lecturer basis. So for regionalism, for instance, I emailed all of the students at a midpoint and said, I think that this is where you are at the moment on active participation. If you're feeling very, very stressed, stop working so hard. You're, you're doing just fine. Stop feeling the pressure. And for those who were not performing so well um, I was saying you've still got time to make it up but if you're happy with this then then that's also fine um, but but that was really about the the best that I could do because our, our structures do not really um, allow for it. well let's say we don't really have structures in place for this um, and I don't you know I mean I think that I think that all you students would kind of support me. In, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe other lecturers are better than me at doing this. I, positive, negative experiences for many of you. So I can just confirm that the, sorry. Um, yeah, go ahead, Lucas, and then I'll come to Sarah. I, uh, I confirmed that the, like having an interim grade, uh, especially for the September intakers who are completely new to the study program and online environment, is extremely helpful. This was just uh, sh showing me um, whether I have, as you said, whether I have to stress and I really have a reason for that, or if I'm just making it up and I can be a little bit more calmer and constant, may concentrate on other subjects or parts where I want to improve. And Sarah? Um, I think what is also important to, know, uh, to mention is that of course, this whole situation is new for everyone, right? So even for lecturers, like they're getting um, used to this whole situation. And I think every lecture teacher has a different approach towards it. And uh, I do believe deeply that everyone wants to help their students to like uh, get the best out of it and feel as connected as, as possible. Um, but uh, there is definitely a difference between lectures. Some uh, take it more in consideration, whereas others either lack the knowledge to know that there is this feeling of not um, not being uh, like on the same line, that all students are like on the same line, uh, or whether the, it's just difficult for them to manage. I think this difference exists and uh, to be honest, I think it's also very difficult to take the difference out because each uh, teacher or lecturer has a different approach to it. So um, you cannot expect uh, them to be all on the same level, which also counts for students, right? Because all students have uh, different feelings, different manners of interacting online or like uh, not online. So uh, it's a very difficult matter, I think. Thank you. Um, 
I think something which has been raised in the chat box, which I think is appropriate at this kind of point, is the notion of trust um, and the kind of, you know, the building trust between the student and the tutor. I just wonder, you know, if we have any more kind of thoughts on, on how we can do that in the online environment, anything that's going to work particularly well. And that could be formal or kind of informal or kind of linked to the course or kind of to one side of the course, perhaps. Yeah, I think um, I'm I'm doing a lot of extra hours with uh, students, so I open my live room um, just occasionally just for us to chat. Sometimes in the evenings, and we just have drinks together. Um, and sometimes I just mute myself and I listen to them and I, I let them get on with it. Sometimes I'm part of the conversation, but. I think it's been important for them to see me as a human being and, and not just um, a lecturer. And actually as well, those um, have been really important times for me because I, because very often they're talking about, you know, connected issues to how, to how they're feeling about things. Um, so I, you know, Kevin probably won't mind me saying the other, you know, the other night we had um, a session and then most people left after about an hour and a half, but a couple of them wanted to stay in. So I was like, okay, I have to go cook my dinner, but I'll leave the live room open. I'm going to mute myself, put my camera off and I will also mute so I can't hear you. And they had to trust that uh, I wasn't listening to them. I wasn't. But then I had the two of them on my screen for about another hour. And I have to say that was a joy to watch because, you know, I had a student in Lida, I had a student in Bulgaria, neither of them Dutch, neither of them have ever seen each other before. And they were just talking. Um, and I actually called my husband to tell him how great that was to see. And I think that for us as well, yeah, I, I miss, I'm missing, I'm missing students walk out of class in groups together and seeing who they're friends with, what they're talking about, who they have a smoke with, all, all of this kind of thing. And I, and I kind of hadn't realized how important that was to trust building, actually, just these very, very small um, things. And so, I, yeah, I've, I've, I've tried to build them in, in, a, in a kind of social way. And I, I have no idea whether that works, but it, it makes me feel better that I've tried, um, at least. Um, and, and I think that the other way is just always to, is to constantly reassure them. Um, so they don't know this, but I'm not going to fail a student for active participation this semester. There is no way that I would do that um, under these types of circumstances. So I suppose that um, I do, I, I do have, I, I do just kind of have this thing of getting to know my students such that um, I know that they are dedicated, that they're interested, that they do do the work and they may not always perform to the best level, but, but they're doing well enough, really. Um, but, I'm, but I'm also lucky, I'm, I'm teaching in classes of, of around 20 students. I'm not teaching a group of 100 students and that would make an enormous difference and I'm not quite sure. So actually one of the professors did ask me about how I would have managed something. And I said, I would have broken them into groups. I would have delivered my lectures asynchronously and then I would have used time and it wouldn't matter if they didn't get, all get to see me every week, as long as they all got to see me at least twice in that, because you know, we sometimes teach in blocks, um, as long as they got to see me twice or otherwise I would have recruited um, other people and said, look, could you just have, um, do you mind just doing a half hour extra class with this group of students so that we can just do actually some of that kind of um, checkpointing. So that's what I would have done. But I'm also aware that I'm working a ridiculous number of hours. Um, so as a professor and as a line manager, I might also have felt really uneasy about asking anybody to do that. So I think it's a really, really difficult space to, um, to manage um, and I, I, I'm not sure whether not sure whether I've achieved it or not but I am content that I've, I've reached out and I've done my best. I think there are all kinds of issues at play for, for, for tutors um, and, and students and one question which has come up which um, is something which we covered in I think the last webinar series which I think kind of links to 
many of the things that we've been talking about, but it's probably perhaps one of the most kind of practical issues which has been raised is that kind of access to things like books, libraries, that kind of thing. Um, it's something which obviously we take for granted um, in a kind of face to face environment. A student will just walk into the library and uh, have access to get a book off the shelf or, or go and speak to a librarian, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, if, if there's something available that we don't want, there can be a conversation, it can be requested, all, all that kind of thing, which is kind of crucial to, to us as lecturers, but also to the student studies as well. Um, have any of you had any issues with that kind of practical side of things? And if so, kind of how have you kind of um, dealt with it? Um, just before we jump in, it's, it's, uh, it, I was just watching <laughs> their faces, uh, and, and I, I, I don't know a student Elijah who's ever had a conversation with a librarian, but uh, but but that's a that's a whole <laughs> different um, uh, um, that's a whole different matter. But um, Jana, because you're in Germany, as you know, you have a you have very particular difficulties here. Yeah, for me personally, it's really difficult because I don't have access to any university library. I mean, there is a library in my town, but it's much more difficult to get access to uh, books or to um, get them delivered if you're not actually a student there. Um, so for me, what I'm practically only relying on is the online um, library of Leiden University. And um, that can be difficult. Um, depending on what the lecturer expects, um, like what kind of literature your, le your lecturer expects you to use. Uh, for example, I'm almost always only using journal articles. And um, if there's like, if the lecturer would request me to use books or um, older sources as well, that could be a problem for me. So that's definitely something that should be taken into consideration. Yeah, can I, I just say, you know, this was something that I looked at uh, through mine, whether everything that I asked them to read, they could get um, online because I knew that we were teaching online. So I went through all of my syllabi and I, I hopefully um, caught them. But actually, otherwise, um, I don't think the library has, if you're in LIDA, I don't think it's been um, a problem, but maybe one of the um, Lucas or Kevin or Sarah. Sarah? Um, yeah, so if you're in Leiden or The Hague, you can still uh, get the books uh, delivered. Um, the only struggle is that when you go to the library, I live in The Hague, so I usually go to Weinhaven here, and uh, then to get in, it's pretty difficult but because you have to show your student card and like they're gonna pinpoint you, please wear a mask, and wherever you go, like there are all these routes that you have to follow and everything. So. Uh, Going to the library itself makes it difficult, but you do you can pick up a book. That, that access is still uh, available. Yeah, and I, I will say, I mean, LIDA has a locker system anyway. So long before, so actually, when we locked down, um, students could still pick up books from the library because there was. This is why I said they'd never really spoken to a librarian. You order everything online. It gets you. You get told which locker it is, and you go and pick it up. So that has always been the case. And. It has for one, it's been a blessing um, in, in this instance, although on, on a normal day, I would have a lot of problems with that system of running a library. I think it, there was a good example of how something practical like that links to the earlier issue of trust that we were talking about. You know, we, we need to make sure that as academics, that, you know, students can trust that we have made this you know, a similarly simple practical step of making sure that our material is actually going to be accessible to them so they can kind of do their studies. That kind of small practical thing, I think, kind of really helps um, the student uh, kind of tutor relationship uh, in, in that respect. But we're getting to the end. We have a few minutes left, um, but we have a question um, from Alex, which I want to kind of end on. Um, it's kind of, you know, something kind of related to online learning that actually was really rewarding perhaps unexpectedly so we often talk about kind of some of the kind of the negatives of, of online learning um, but as we know from our previous webinar series in the spring and the summer there's actually you know potentially some kind of benefits to or kind of unexpected benefits so if anyone you know, as a student or Maxine you as a lecturer um, has come across anything unexpectedly rewarding or useful that you can perhaps use in the future perhaps you can uh, let us know well, thank you for this question because uh, I, I did ask the students to think of something positive that they could say and they all looked at me very blankly before when I asked them <laughs> this, but I said, okay, you've, you've got between now and the webinar to come up with something. So I'll, I'll see if they have, but what I would say is that I will do, there are certain things that I will do differently in the future. 
And I have looked at this as an opportunity to learn how to do things that I already did better or to do new things. Um, I'm a big believer in lectures. I'm not one of those, obviously that was my, that was my seminar in, in August. I, I believe in lectures, but I won't deliver one in a classroom again. I'll deliver it asynchronously so that I have the time um, always in class to discuss um, things with students and to have a more of a conversation with students. Um, and then the other thing is that, yes, I, I, you know, I was saying at the beginning, of, I think before we kind of really started that I, I'm now a video editor, um, but I have had to up my skills. Um, I wish it weren't under such pressured circumstances. I wish I did them better, but I will do them. I will learn. I will do it better and I will use different tools in my teaching. Um, and, um, and I think that that's actually important if we are living in, a, in the digital world that we are. So I, I, I can't be a Luddite anymore if, if I ever was, I don't know. But anyway, um, who wants to go first? You're positive. <laughs> oh, Jana, let's, let's, let's go with you while you can still talk. Yeah, so um, I think for me, the positive thing i can maybe see in it yeah everything takes a little longer online and there are some difficulties but um you save the commute and that's true i mean uh, yeah it's it may be <laughs> not so nice that you just transition from your bed to your desk every morning but on the other hand that's half an hour or longer uh you have to sleep yeah you can sleep longer so i think that's something positive i can see in it and also after the lectures like you can immediately like i i'm in the lucky position that I'm um, living on the countryside. So I can just walk outside immediately and um, have a walk. And yeah, that's something I find is nice. Thank you, Jana. And Lucas, you had your hand up. Yeah, so I think um, two things that I, um, so first of all, um, we um, for our masters also have to do a lot of reading, which I was not so used to used to do before, not in that extent. Um, and I feel it's connected a little bit with what, what uh, Jana said. I feel a little bit, I have more energy left after a day of lectures being at home for like kind of do additional reading or even watch something else because maybe I think everyone can relate after a long day when you go to university then you cycle through the rain and like you, you come home, you're tired. You don't like personally, like I, I don't want to read anything anymore. So I may have more uh, energy and time time and energy both actually for this. The other part that I, uh, I hope that will sustain after um, online learning and also maybe for uh, my future uh, professional life is uh, self-organization. Self um, right now I have to organize my day because no one is doing it for me. I may have pre-recorded lectures 12 over one semester. It's, I have to organize when am I watching them um, and what I'm going to do uh, over my day. So I. I got really good of it. I wake up earlier sometimes now than I would if I would have to go to university, um, which was a surprise. Um, and maybe that uh, is something that will stay in the future. Thank you. That's really important, I think. So, Sarah? Um, yeah, to add to what Lucas said, I think this pandemic will change many things in the future as well. And I think. Um, this online learning environment has kind of proved that you can do a lot of meetings online and you can do uh, a lot of group work online as well. And I think that will continue to also go into my future career or whatsoever, because when I look at job openings, I see a lot of places writing, commute, working, working from home. And um, I think this experience has taught me a lot about it. So that could be a positive outcome. So do you think that you're more productive as well? Um, to be honest, no. Uh, I do have to uh, push myself to really uh, be able to focus when I'm constantly just on the screen. Uh, but as Jenna also mentioned, I think taking a walk or just going outside for, uh, for a bit and uh, coming back does definitely help. And Kevin? Um, well, to name the positives, I think one of the positive things uh, was it kind of forced students to familiarize themselves with like tools and technology because I remember like last year, some people were just like Google Docs, no, never heard, and I, I, I don't care either to like, you know, work with it. Um, so it, it kind of, you know, 
it was an incentive for students to actually like you know familiarize themselves with the tech and well and the other thing it does eliminate many of like the distractions you would usually have i don't know if that's necessarily a bad, like a good thing but yeah thank you thanks you thank you maxine and thank you everyone um as, as well i think for me one of the really positive things is about you know the fact that we can you know get together much more easily across the kind of you know politics and international studies community you know as academics and also to speak to students etc you know would we have done this before before this situation in this particular way we probably would have had a face-to-face -face event with all of that cost etc so while i'm not for, for one minute saying i would uh, like to kind of carry on doing like doing this for, for, for you know for, for eternity at the same time i think we have to kind of look at the positives and and, and this is, is is one of the positives so Thank you so much. Um, as we're now at, at just gone, gone 12 o'clock um, for, for presenting and, and hearing from students and tutors, it's been a great session. Um, we have been recording and it will appear on our website shortly. Um, and um, uh, so please, if you if you know if you couldn't attend because of lectures, seminars, etc., please um, pass that to them. And also do spread the word about the webinars. Um, they are open to anyone to attend. And also, you know, please, you know, look look at our Twitter feed to kind of if you want to kind of join in online as well. The next session is on Tuesday, the first of December at three o'clock, hosted by Helen Williams from Nottingham, uh, and that's on external examining in politics. Uh, rigor and inclusion so we're kind of shifting our focus to external examining there so we hope to see you there and thank you very much for attending